The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar, Calling All Employees. You have the power to control your workers' comp costs. And you do. My name is Julie Dorr and I am going to be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes and the remaining time we'll hold available for your questions. If you have any questions right now, you can certainly use the question section that's available on your dashboard part of your webinar and enter those in and we'll get to them at the end. Or you can email me, and my email address is right here on the screen, julie at the door group, and we'll be happy to answer any of those questions at the end. And again, we've got a big group on today, so I highly recommend you get your questions in there. Um, earlier this morning, we sent you a link to a downloadable copy of our presentation. If you haven't received it yet or maybe it got lost in spam, certainly send me an email right now and I'll also send you that document. Before we get started, please note that this webinar and all the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend that you consult with legal counsel to, to address your specific situation. So we're really excited today because we have assembled a great panel um, of experts that really are going to help you work with not only your worker comp insurance, but also containing costs. Um, and let me start by introducing the illustrious Linda Duffy in Absentia. Linda with Ethos Human Capital Solutions is actually at a conference in San Diego, and she hopes to join us during the Q&A. But you know Linda, she works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership ta talent, and increase organizational effectiveness. We also have, of course, attorney Marla Mira Robinson. Marla's with the law firm Mira Robinson, Jackson and Clarkson, where she's a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices in the area of corporate, mergers and acquisitions, real estate, finance, and employment law. And then, of course, we have assembled, as I said earlier, a group of guest panelists. And the first one here is Griff Griffiths. He's with GMGS Risk Management and Insurance Services. Griff taps into his CPA side to help clients get the best combination of coverage and premiums, as well as offers training through his Workers' Compensation School. We also have our next expert panelist is George McLaughlin of Tutton Insurance Services. George has a focus on risk management, mitigating and reducing exposure for his clients while offering them customized service. And then last but not least, but bringing up our tail end of our presenters, is Diana Henderson with the Henderson Group. Diana focuses on delivering cost-effective approaches to manage employers, workers' compensation programs, and disability management. So as we mentioned earlier, we've got this great agenda put together, covering some of the basics, but then also going in a little bit more depth on how you can actually lower your worker comp costs. So here's our agenda. We're going to cover what is an XMOD factor, how can employee education and training lower worker compensation costs, are there pre-injury strategies to build awareness, improve company safety, and lower worker comp costs? When injuries and worker comp claims occur, what actions can you guys take to help minimize the damage? How can we best manage worker comp claims? And then lastly, Marla's going to cover how to prevent the 132A claim. So we are going to get started today with Griff. Griff, are you there and ready to deliver some information on what is an XMOD factor? Julie, I'm here and I'm excited. Uh, we, in fact, are going to help uh, the participants understand how they can control their workers' compensation costs. And probably a, a good place to start is beginning with the XMOD factor. The XMOD factor is, is actually a multiplier, and those of us in the insurance profession or risk management profession or even human resources, uh, we uh, use kind of the nickname the XMOD factor, but the, the real name is called the experience modification factor. Um, as you can see in the slide that I've put up here on the screen, this XMOD factor plays a tremendous financial impact on employers and their cost of insurance. In fact, if you look at it, uh, this multiplier can either increase or decrease a company's total cost of workers' compensation premiums. In the example I give here, I show uh, that a company has gone out and shopped their insurance and come up with a quoted premium of $100,000. Uh, 
Now what happens is the insurance company, once they've quoted it here, they apply that multiplier, that X mod factor. And you can see two scenarios where the 151% X mod factor is applied and calculates a final premium of $151,000. In the second example, you can see a, an X mod factor of 74% being applied and the final premium being $74,000. There's a $77,000 spread between those two scenarios, which is directly controlled by the X mod factor. So in summary, what I'd like to say to kind of begin this process is, if you control the X mod factor of your company, then you definitely have control over your workers' compensation costs. Now, some people would ask, well, what's a good experience modification factor and what's a bad one? Well. I've worked with companies that have excellent X mod factors in the 40s, meaning the 40th percentile. Or I've worked with many companies that have X mod factors of way above 200. And uh, our job is to go in and help them repair, so to speak, that situation. In the next slide, I show you what an actual workers' compensation experience rate form looks like. Uh, we, we try to really utilize the term the safety scorecard. And this safety scorecard is calculated by the WCIRB for every company, uh, this one in particular in California. Uh, and this is really important for business owners, but as we've seen, for even employees to understand. In the next slide, I'm going to break it down what that experience uh, modification factor is calculated uh, through. And basically what the WCIRB does is take their formula and utilize the dollar amount of your claims for the past three years, the quantity and types of your workers' compensation claims for the past three years, and then inputs the amount of payroll by workers' compensation classification for the past three years, and out comes your experience modification factor, or your multiplier. Now, this becomes particularly important because obviously it's going to determine how much you pay for your workers' compensation costs. And from the standpoint of an employee, believe it or not, this becomes quite important. Because as we teach in workers' compensation school, there's a bank account in every business. And from that bank account, we pay all of our costs, including benefits and salaries, but as well, workers' compensation costs. And if, in fact, the insurance company are pulling more money out of that same bank account for insurance costs, there's less money in that bank account to go towards notably uh, important things such as employee benefits, employee salaries, and, and wages. So that becomes a, a very, very key point. Now I want to emphasize this. I want to move to the next slide and, and, and demonstrate something quite important here. Uh, it's, it's a teaching point. And the question is, uh, why do we need um, why do we need workers' compensation school and specifically uh, in, in the area of um, why do we need to work safe? A lot of times it's a, it's a company rule. It's a requirement to work safe. But employees, when they can learn why they need to work safe, it's amazing the success or the benefits that come from that. Now, as a risk manager and an employee trainer, it's my job to teach them. And in this picture, you can see an example of, of my teaching uh, a company um, workers' compensation school. And ultimately, I stand up before them and I tell them that my job is, number one, to protect them, to make sure that they go home safe and sound every night. Number two, my job is to teach them what to do if they do get injured, injured on the job so that we can take good care of them. Number three, my job is to help protect their jobs. Because if I can help them protect their jobs, it protects their ability to provide for their families. So as you can see, if this focus of workers' compensation school is the benefit of the employee as well as protecting the company, it provides some unique benefits. And in the end, everybody participating, all employees, they walk away understanding why they need to work safe. Now I'd like to move to the next slide because besides learning why we need to work safe, there are four other key questions that we address in workers' compensation school. Not only do we need to understand why we need to work safe, but who really pays for workers' compensation claims? How claims impact the employees personally? And then ultimately, what is the truth about workers' compensation litigation and fraud? Now, moving from this point, it's important to understand that if we can address these questions and help employees understand workers' compensation, 
it has a tremendous impact on a company's culture. In fact, a company's safety culture. And it's amazing to see that once employees are brought into the, to the fold, so to speak, and they understand these things, they begin to feel truly like they're the company's greatest asset. Now, to add to this, we have found that in workers' compensation school, by teaching the classes in their native tongue, that being English or Spanish, and all five classes in the, in the, in the complete curriculum, they not only learn a need for working safe, but they become desirous. They, they want to work safe because they see a clear picture of what the benefits might be. Now, if we move to the next slide, I want to address the question, who really pays for their claims? Because in this slide, we can see a column there of insurance company costs. But to the left, we can see examples of employee injuries that have occurred. But most importantly, if you look to the right, you can see the actual costs assessed to the employer or to the company. And it's tremendous for an employee to learn that, for example, a chemical burn that was $575 paid by the insurance company actually was assessed to us at $1,843. And again, that money coming by way of the modified insurance premium because of their, their safety scorecard or their safety score, they start to begin to realize that every claim, every accident impacts them. Now, I won't go through each of the injury examples, but you can see a trend very clearly here that regardless of what the insurance company pays for a claim, the ultimate cost by way of a X mod modified premium, the company is going to pay for their claims. Secondarily, it's noted that uh, when lawyers get involved in a work comp claim, it's going to double those costs to the employer, and that impacts the every employee. Now, moving through this process, a lot of times people would say, is this too complicated for employees to understand? And I would say it really isn't. If you look at the next slide, it demonstrates the three-year example of actual claims, actual dollar amounts, and so forth, and how that X mod is calculated. In this case, it's 130%. Now, once again, once the employees understand that we're keeping score and, it, and it's in a competition with others in our industry, in a game, so to speak, a game, in a competition for money, it becomes very important to them. Now, my job as a risk manager and as an, as an employee educator is to focus on I would rather see those monies stay inside the company and go towards salaries, benefits, and preventing job layoffs than, than going to the insurance companies. And once employees feel that, and I emphasize the important part of it, is they feel that, they become members of the team. They become naturally members of the safety team. Another area that I'd like to just touch on is in the next slide, because a lot of times we hear things about workers' compensation fraud. And it is true, workers' compensation fraud costs us a lot of money. Um, it, one of the things that's critical to educating employees is letting them know that it's a felony in the state of California that there are serious penalties, such as prison time and fines. There's another side uh, of, the, of the impact in workers' compensation on the legal side. And if you look at the next slide, I show an example of an advertisement from an attorney. And really, the case being is this. If employees know that they're the greatest assets in your company, and they've got people, risk management team members there to help them through claims or injuries, there's no reason to litigate, and therefore there's no reason to double the cost of the claim. It becomes a very positive culture, a very positive environment. In the last slide, I'd like to show you kind of a summary, because ultimately, if we can take our employees and our company management and even the owners from a point of understanding the XMOD factor and utilize employee education and help them understand how the workers' compensation system really works, we're not only going to bring the percentage of litigation down and the percentage and number of claims down, we're going to see this transfer into many benefits of the company. Uh, examples of that would be is, as we see our claims come down in cost and number, and we see our employees return back to work sooner than they used to, and we see the litigation levels hit, in my case, uh, most of my clients uh, experience no more than 5% of their claims get litigated we start to see the culture and the morale of the company improve. And bottom line, because I am an accountant, you see greater profitability. 
ultimately, this is some of the things I can share with the panel and share with the, the, the listeners about what true employee education can do in the area of workers' compensation. What I'd like to do is pass the torch over to George McLaughlin, who's going to address pre-employment and pre-injury strategies to help us continue to learn how to control our workers' compensation costs. Thanks, Griff. Um, in addition to employee education, there are other areas that you should focus on to help control your claims and therefore your workers' compensation premiums. Human resources, safety, ergonomics, and safety incentive. Undergirding all that is claims management, which Diana Henderson will talk about after me. And on the next slide, you'll see that we outline some specific activities that you can take that kind of fall under the human resource genre. Uh, a lot of it has to do with pre-screening. Before you hire someone, you want to make sure that they're going to be able to perform the job that you're going to assign them. So that, that would involve a, a post-offer physical, uh, performing a background check to make sure you're going to hiring a good citizen, uh, also doing reference checks, although they're not quite as powerful as they once used to be, they're still an important function of a pre-screening process, and also drug screening, which is usually done in conjunction with the physical. All of these are great tools to make sure that when you hire, you're hiring, you're not hiring in a claim. So I can't tell you how many clients of mine have hired someone who was already injured when they could have performed a screen and made sure that that particular prospective employee was not going to be hired for them. So on the next slide, you'll see some different activities, because normally you think of safety as injury and illness and prevention and OSHA compliance. And these are some uh, safety activities that you can perform that are powerful in providing um, a, a, an impact on claims reduction. And the first one is using a temp to hire strategy where you're working with a, a temporary staffing agency uh, to hire somebody in and maybe work with them for six, nine months, or a year to find out if they're going to be a good employee before you put them on your permanent, uh, as a permanent employee. Um, I also like expanding accident investigations to the point where you're including near misses on every time that you have a, a potentially a near miss. For example, one of my clients almost had an employee hit by a forklift turning the corner in a warehouse. He did a full accident investigation, figured out he had some blind spots in the warehouse. He put up some curved mirrors, and it went a long way toward preventing uh, what could have been potentially a very dangerous claim in the future. Uh, and finally, Paying your own first aid claims, as Griffin alluded to earlier, and I, I will uh, show you on my next slide, is a very powerful tool. You are allowed via the labor code to pay your own first claim, aid claims. And you'll see on the next slide that paying your own first aid claims, this company I insure in Stanton, California, paid approximately $10,000 in first aid claims, and they were able to reduce their premiums by $36,000 over a three-year period. So it's a very powerful tool. It has to be used in accordance with the labor code, but it's also very effective. On the next slide, you'll see evidence of some ergonomic actions. Now, not everyone needs uh, ergonomic activities, but many jobs do involve repetitive motion. Um, so you can do job rotation which can be disruptive, I would encourage you to have your uh, employees provide you with suggestions. Obviously, you could also use outside experts for solutions. A real simple example of this is office ergonomics. 
I'm known around here at my office as the office nag because pretty much everybody sits in their chair in front of their computer just like this gentleman here where on the next slide it'll show you a, a simple way to correct your posture and the easiest way to remember this is you want your computer screen at eye level and everything else is at 90 degrees. The elbows, the hips, the knees, and then the feet are either firmly on the floor or the slightly elevated. So it's, real, it's a real simple uh, fix, uh, but oftentimes it's ignored. And really carpal tunnel is, uh, is, a, is a very big injury. And you, you really want to avoid that, if at all possible, because it can be very expensive. On the next slide, it just goes into different areas of safety incentive and how you can use safety incentives to, again, change the culture and reduce the cost of your workers' compensation. You can provide incentives for attending meetings, attending trainings, participating in your ergonomics program, making safety suggestions. Um, so there's, there's many ways to design a safety incentive program. It has to be the right fit for your company. But once they're in place, they're very, very effective in, uh, in reducing the cost of your insurance. And now we're going to hand it over to Diana Henderson, who's going to talk about claims management. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. I'm going to give you some tips. These are very important tips on how you can take control of your workers' comp costs, how you can yourself as an employer impact your experience mod, because that's what this is really all about. You really want to save money here, and, and Griff has done a great job in explaining how, that's all the, how that all comes together. So if you go to the next slide, let's talk about the admitted injury. This is one that we don't get too excited about. But I want to be sure that you are filing this claim as soon as possible. Don't wait. There are studies out there that show that the longer you wait to file a claim, the more it costs. And when you file that claim, get the claim information, get the claim number, get the claim handler name and their contact information. And most of you know that you're going to get a call from that claims adjuster at some point in time, usually 24 to 48 hours. Don't wait for them to call you. Be proactive. Call them. Make sure that they did get the claim. Make sure that they know your side of whatever the story is. There may be some information that you're going to have to provide to them or want to provide to them that they may not even ask the question about. Also, any internal investigation documents that you've put together, for example, supervisory statements, employee statements, witness statements, and the like, and as George mentioned, what about those investigations that you do on the incidents that result in injury? While they may be safety related, those are good things to send to a claims adjuster. Give them a better picture. They can visualize what took place. Inquire about what's going on, right? Always, always with a focus on closure. How are we going to get to the end of this case? And this is where I help many of my clients, is to keep the focus of that claims adjuster on their particular claim or claims. Because quite honestly, a claims adjuster has anywhere from 125 to 200 claim files on their desk at any given time. And you don't know where you sit in that pile. And many of my clients ask me to get their claim up to the top, which I help them do. And don't abandon your injured worker. They're still your employee. They want to know that they're still valued. So my first tip is engage, stay engaged, and not only with the claim handler, but also with your injured worker. So now I want to go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about the dreaded questionable claim. Another one, file it as soon as possible. I know many of us would just like to throw it at the back of that credence and say, OK, I didn't see it, don't want to talk about it. But you really need to jump on this quickly. And when you file the claim with the, with the carrier, use those magic words. This is a questionable claim. 
we do not believe this claim happened here. We absolutely want an investigation. And then proactively make those contacts again. Make sure you give that claims adjuster anything and everything you believe that would help them in the compensability decision. Because at the end of the day, the claims adjuster is the one that's going to be making that decision. But you don't want them to do it in a vacuum. Now, on many questionable claims, the claims adjuster will, at some point in the life of the file, ask you for a copy of the personnel file. Why not send it to them? Get ready, be prepared to send that to them. And ultimately, you may end up sending that to defense counsel yourself, or the claims adjuster will do that for you. The investigation can take upwards of 90 days. Claims adjusters have 90 days from the day you know about the questionable claim and that's 90 calendar days, to make a compensability decision. It's not 90 days from the day you finally send them the claim. So your date of knowledge is the trigger. Now, I also encourage my clients to attend depositions, especially on questionable claims. It keeps employees honest or ex-employees honest. And when the deposition is going on, you can kind of kick that defense attorney under the table when you hear an answer to a question that is not really true. And maybe take a little break, let the attorney know exactly what's going on, and they can then go in and do some more questioning. Now, whether it's the admitted claim or the questionable claim, I think tip number two works for both. Out of sight should never be out of mind. I know with many employers, once they pass the claim over to the claims organization, they then say, well, it's theirs. It's all theirs. So impacting the experience mod, the dollars that go in to the indemnity bucket and the medical bucket are what make your experience mod. And you want to be sure that those numbers are as good as they possibly can get. And here you can see what sort of payments are within each one of those buckets. Now, if you have a great return to work policy, if you get people back on light duty when modified work restrictions are provided by the physician, this is a great way to impact indemnity costs. And the one thing I want you to remember is that even though you have a full-time employee who is now off of work, a light duty job does not have to be that same full-time hours. You can bring them in a couple of days a week. You can bring them in a couple of hours a day. There may be some wage loss that the claims organization will pay them, but at least you're mitigating some of the costs and you're getting the person back into the office, back into the factory, back into the warehouse, and that will mitigate some of those costs. Also, when you send your injured workers to the clinic, send them to the best one possible. Send them to a place that you wouldn't mind sending your family to. That is the best barometer of what clinic you should send your injured workers to. We have medical provider networks now. They've been around for several years, and the MPNs are in place. You've probably administered them. You have your posters up on the wall. Use those clinics. There's probably a lot to choose from. I would even suggest that if you really want to find the best one, go out and have an interview. Right? The next thing is, on that, my last tip here is question and understand the rationale behind the total incurred dollars. Now where I come into the picture with my clients is I understand what goes into those dollars. I understand how those dollars have an impact. And the best, the best reserve on a claim file is one that accurately reflects the possible outcome. Not worst case scenario, but the most probable and possible outcome. So let's go to the last slide here for me. So my last words to you are, make sure that you're having great communication with your claims adjuster, that you're also having great communication with your injured worker. Stay engaged. Don't check out. This process is something that you need to be involved in. And if you don't want to be involved in it, Find someone who can help you be involved in it. And of course, ask questions. And also know what questions to ask next. So I hope this has been informative. 
and you can take these tips to heart. And with that, I'd like to pass the torch over to Marla Murhab Robinson. And she's going to be talking about one of those dreaded topics that we never want to see, the Labor Code Section 132A, which is an add-on to a workers' comp claim. So with that, Marla, send it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana and Griff and George. Oh my gosh, this has been so great, all this takeaway information. Um, I, I applaud you all. Um, so as everyone knows, our, our workers' compensation system is, is what's called a no-fault system. It has remedies. No matter whose fault it is, if you get injured at work, the workers' compensation system is going to give you a remedy, except in two instances. Um, and the first is serious and willful. If, if you have an employer who's engaged in a pattern or practice of unsafe activity, um, for example, several OSHA violations on a piece of equipment that the employer has failed to uh, maintain or have fixed if it's damaged, then the employer's workers' compensation insurance is not going to kick in, and it won't be no fault. That will come out of the employer's pocket. So obviously we want to avoid that at all costs, so we don't want to engage as employers in any serious and willful misconduct. So maintaining your equipment, maintaining your safety training, and all of what Griff and, and, and George and Diana have been talking about is very important. The second exception to no fault is discrimination um, against an employee. And this is, falls under Labor Code Section 132A for those of you who like to look up the code sections. And it prohibits discrimination against workers who are injured while working and or who file a claim. It actually states that an employer who discharges or threatens to discharge or in any manner discriminates. So that can be a demotion. It could be changing their hours. Um, and if it's because the employee filed or made known his or her intention to file a claim for compensation with the employer or an application for an adjudication or because the employee has received a rating, an award, or a settlement, if the employer takes any action um, for any of those reasons, the employer is going to be liable under 132A. The, the, the penalties here on, on your slide, it says employee's compensation increased by one half up to 10,000. That's not their compensation, their hourly or, or salary at work. That's their workers' compensation award. So that's the language out of the statute. It does say compensation, but it's not wages, if you will. It's their workers' compensation award. Whatever that award happens to be, it can be increased by one half up to $10,000. They'd also be entitled to their costs and expenses up to $250. And reinstatement and reimbursement for lost wages and benefits for the time they're out. Now that does not include for periods when they're ready, willing, and able to work, even if they don't. So if you're able to show that they're, they're ready, willing, and able to work, and they don't, then that, they would not be reimbursed for that period of time. If you could jump to the next slide. For an award um, under 132A, an employee must establish a prima facie case of lost wages and benefits that's caused, caused by the employer's discriminatory act. Again, they have to sh show the fault. We call it a nexus. We have to show that the action taken by the employer was actually because of one of those listed protections, either the filing of the claim, the, the making known the intention to file a claim, the adjudication of a claim, the settlement of a claim. So the employee has a burden of proving that. If the employee makes that initial case, then the burden shifts to the employer to establish an affirmative defense. The, the employer must show a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason for taking the actions the employer took. So for example, if it's uh, because of a, a, there's a demotion, show that the employee's performance warranted the demotion. If it's a termination, same thing. So you want a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason, in other words, a business reason. There are also business reality defenses. The employer does not have to reemploy unqualified employees or if positions are no longer available because it's been completely eliminated. Also, the employer is not guilty of retaliatory discrimination if the employee cannot perform the customary work without risk of either re-injury or further injury or injuring someone else. 
Um, safety is the number one concern. I, I know it doesn't always seem that way, but hopefully with what Griff and George and Diana went over, it, 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 you, you can take away from this that that is exactly what you should be concentrating on for everyone's benefit. Because there is another statute that requires employers to take all steps necessary to maintain a safe work environment for all employees. Now let's talk a little bit about the actual process of 132A claims and what we do when, when our employer clients are, are faced with one. The first thing is to understand that the workers' comp litigation process is informal, much different than the civil process that many of you may have been involved in. It's a very informal process, and it's so informal, in fact, that when, you're, uh, when you receive a 132A petition, uh, for for uh, penalties and, and reinstatement, you do not have a, a, an exact date in which you need to respond. What we do is we respond immediately, to Diana's point, to put everybody on notice that we uh, have a defense to the petition and to put those facts out there. The other thing we do is we immediately notify the carrier that we have received the 132A petition. Now, it's not covered by the insurance. So the carrier does not have any direct interest, except that we ask the carrier every time, please do not settle the underlying claim without settling the 132A petition as well. I will tell you in my 25 plus years of practice, 99% of the 132A petitions go away with the settlement of the underlying claim. Because the claimant is more interested in the workers' compensation um, payments than they are in the 132A. I have had a, an occasion where an employer has participated and thrown some settlement money in. I've not had any that have resulted in reinstatement, which is good because you really don't want an employee back sometimes. But we send a letter immediately to the carrier and advise them, please do not settle this case, the underlying workers' compensation claim, without also settling the 132A. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is, in addition to being informal, the workers' compensation um, process, as some of you may know, can take a very, very long time. So we just sit and wait and wait and wait. Um, and unlike civil litigation, we don't have to do a lot of work. We don't have to do discovery and depositions and subpoenas and the like. We just sit and wait and watch the case. We even ask the carrier uh, attorney that has been appointed by the carrier for your defense to make the occasional court appearances on our behalf. There's settlement conferences, case status conferences, and they're generally willing to do that. Why is that important? Because your 132A claim, again, is not covered by insurance. So you want to do everything you can to keep your costs down with your counsel, and that is one way to do it. So it's really a wait and see game. If you have to go to trial afterwards, it will be only after a claim has been established. It, it will be after a claim has been established and proven by the employee. So it's very rare that it gets to that place. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie for questions. Well, thank you so much, Marla, and the rest of the panel. That was extremely informative. And thank you for putting together these great slides and helping to educate us on how we can reduce costs and and control our XMOD a little bit better. That does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar, so now we'd like to spend the remaining time answering your questions. Many of you have already started submitting your questions via the uh, webinar interface. Just go into the questions section that's on your little dashboard and type in your question, and I'll read them aloud for our panelists to answer. Or, of course, you can continue to email me directly, julie at the door group. That's D-O-R-R group.com, and I will also handle those questions via email. So let's get started. Um, reading this, Marla, I think this might be one that you might want to answer. Um, we have an employee who has been on workers' comp leave of absence for over a year. Can we fire them? That's a great question. And the answer to can you fire an employee is always yes, you can. But the next question is should you? Should you? And I, I would encourage you, if you have an employee um, workers' comp, to always contact your attorney and have a discussion before. And the discussion would go something like this. Why do you want to terminate them? 
we need to know the reason why. Because we want to make sure that we don't create the 132A action. And I will tell you also when you call that you're going to get the 132A even if you have a legitimate reason. So let's say we're eliminating a position. We're just getting rid of it. We're not going to have that position anymore. And this is legitimate because a lot of times it's not. I have to tell employers, don't tell me you're getting rid of a position if you're not really getting rid of it. You're not going to advertise for it six months later. But let's say we are getting rid of a position, a very legitimate reason to terminate an employee. But you need to be aware that the 132A action will be coming if you terminate that employee. If you take any action, any discriminatory action against the employee, you will get a 132A petition every single time. And the reason for that is that it's so simple to bring. The attorney is already in place, assuming you have an attorney for the employee. It's a simple filing of a couple pages that says, this action was taken against me because of, of this underlying claim not because of any reason given by the employer. So you must be prepared to defend that and spend the money that it takes to defend that. So we want to look at what, what is the real reason why we're terminating the employee. Oftentimes, these employees won't come back if you let the time go by and let the underlying claim get settled. Sometimes they want to come back right away, and sometimes there's reasons for taking them back, as Diana pointed out. So we want to, we want to look at should we terminate them, not can we? The answer to can we is absolutely. You can terminate anybody anytime. It's should you, because it may result in, in a claim, and do you want to defend that claim? Great. Anybody else want to add in anything, other panelists? OK. Let's move on to the next question then. We have one here. How can we find out what our X mod is, and what can we do short term to lower it? George, do you want to start off on that one? Sure. Uh, well, the, the simplest way to find out what your X mod is is either ask your broker, or you can call yourself directly into the WCARB, which is actually short for uh, Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau, and that phone number is four one five seven 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 zero seven seven seven. And you can ask for uh, an ombudsman or customer service, and you would let them know the name of your company. If you have your bureau number handy, you can provide that. If you don't have it, they can look you up by name. OK, good. Gosh, you have that memorized, that phone number. That's kind of scary. And what, <laughs> it what is. can you do short term to lower those X mods? Well, in the short term, the experience modification is based on information that was provided to the WCARB six months prior to your policy renewing. And then that uh, figure is calculated anywhere from 60, 45, 30 days before your policy renews. So unless there's some sort of clerical error, which I have found before, um, or there's some sort of subrogation recovery uh, from an at-fault auto accident, for example, um, it's very difficult to achieve a change short-term. It's all about long-term savings is where you're headed with this. OK. OK, so no short-term fix. But you know, still good. You should be checking your X mod, obviously, with the, the correct agencies, and then working with maybe your brokers on how to do a more strategic, longer-term fix to reduce costs or to reduce your your X mod. Is that correct? That's correct. Perfect. Hey, Griffin and um, Diana or Marla, anyone else want to chime in here? Yeah, you know, Diana. I might add one I'd, comp go ahead, Diana. Oh, oh thanks, Chris. Um, what I would say is that. You know, your, your, your bad behavior kind of follows you for three years. So if you've had some, some serious injuries or maybe some post-termination claims that have been filed, you know, it's really hard to get away from that. But knowing that that has been the problem that's impacted your XMOD and finding a way to change that, you know, trying to find a way to change your direction by using your history is really the best way. What did I do before that caused this problem? What can I do over the next year and beyond so that I can make this X mod better you know, over, the next, over the course of time? OK, good. And Griff, I know you wanted to add something as well. 
Well, I wanted to echo some of the things that Diana taught us, that uh, we may not change our X mod in the short term, but as the time comes for it to be calculated, the analysis of the claims, uh, specifically the reserves, the costs, is paramount to knowing what information is going to be turned into the WCRB by the insurance companies. And then I might add, the more contact that the employer or the, the risk manager has with those employees, oftentimes claims are just running, so to speak. And an employee may not have any idea that that claim can be closed or that it's waiting on them. And I found that personal contact with employees to find out if they have questions or to find out how they're doing uh, really helps us tighten up and close claims much quicker. And all we're really doing is offering to address questions or concerns. And in that education process, we discover that the employee's back to work and they don't have any need for any more care or treatment. And then we connect the dots with the claims adjuster. And, and so you, you can control that aspect of the experience modification or the X mod being calculated. Great, great. Thank you, panel. Um, we have another question, and Diana, this might be one for you. Um, we have an employee who said he injured his back on the job, but other employees told us he heard it playing sports on the weekend. I can relate to that one. How can we get our carrier to fight the claim? Well, I guess the, the first good news about that is that you actually had, empl that you had employees come forward and say, hey, guess what? This person injured themselves doing something else. So now at least we have what a claims adjuster would really jump on. They love to hear that kind of stuff. Oh, there's someone who knows. Are they willing to be interviewed? Are they willing to maybe make a statement about that? So that's wonderful. But I will tell you most of the time what I get from my clients is I think that this person is out there doing something that they say that they can't do, or I think they're out there doing something that the doctor tells them not to do. Well, what the doctor tells them not to do when they go out there and do it anyway, well, that's just kind of stupidity, right? They shouldn't be doing that. But if they're telling the doctor they can't do certain things and they are out there doing those certain things, the claims adjuster does want to hear about that. And before they do surveillance, they want to be able to say that they have an articulable suspicion. So if, any, if you take anything away from this, it's be able to articulate what your suspicions are and have some facts to back it up instead of just a gut reaction or, gee, I'm curious, what are they doing? And that will really get the attention of a claims adjuster. And they'll do something about it. Great. Um, panelists, anybody else want to jump in here? Yeah, I'd like to. Um, and just really to piggyback on what Diana said, getting the attention of your claims adjuster. I'll tell you what, she's, she's not kidding when she tells you how many um, claims they have on their desk. Sometimes I would say, suggest even more. You need to be the thorn in their side to, when you have a claim that's questionable to constantly be on that adjuster and also doing your own work. So she spoke slightly about the surveillance, which we've used very successfully many, many times. Then in addition, use your other um, tools that you have available that don't cost anything. For example, I have a client who had an employee claim he was injured at work um, by taking something off of a shelf. And the employer was friends with the employee on Facebook, and we were able to prove from pictures posted to Facebook that that's not how the employee was injured because the employee posted pictures of how he was actually injured. So use those tools as well and be your own advocate to, to to fight the claims that you feel are false. And again, to all of the panel's um, points, the ones that aren't, aren't false, don't fight, don't fight them. Embrace them. Get, take care of them. Learn from them. And then train your employees on how to avoid them in the future. A little too much information there for that <laughs> one guy. Yeah, social media gets you in trouble every time, right? Yes. <laughs> all righty. Oh, yes, Griff, go ahead. If I could just add one other thing, um, it's interesting. If your company is charting or tracking workers' compensation claims on a daily basis, you, you build in, if you will, kind of a deputized safety force. And if a claim all of a sudden pops up on the board in the lunchroom that says we had a lost time injury, and 
the culture has changed so that everybody has ownership in that safety program, it lends itself to what Diana was talking about. If somebody says, wait a minute, who got hurt and what claim happened? Um, because if everybody knows that it's everybody in it together, people are a lot less likely to commit fraud, are a lot less likely to do something because they know it's not just an insurance company watching over it, that everybody on the team is tracking that, that, that safety record, so to speak. And I found that it's amazing the transformation occurs when all employees feel empowered, not, not to be the sheriff, but to, to be actively involved in the support and, and the tracking, so to speak, of workers' compensation activity. And it, it lends itself to, to what your example was, that if somebody's going to come in and file a fictitious or fraudulent claim, well, they've got a whole bunch of employees out there that are you know, saying, wait a minute, now, when did this happen and what day and so forth? And it really causes uh, an ownership uh, to the safety and risk management program. Well, that's a Julie, nice. if I could chime in here, yes. I, I just want to point out what, what Griff said is absolutely correct and to touch on something that George spoke very briefly about that we've had huge success with, and that is the incentive program. If you can educate the employees, as Griff has suggested, in the school and then put in place an incentive program where there's some benefit to everybody, we've raffled off dishwashers, we've raffled off big screen TVs, we've raffled off gift circuits certificates, um, giving every employee an opportunity to win something does cause them not to be sheriffs so much, but to be partners in watching out for each other. So when Joe comes in without his steel-toed sh shoes on, Mary says, hey, Joe, go get your shoes. We don't want to have an issue here. Or somebody fails to wear their glasses. It, it really creates a culture of safety um, that will help, and we've seen this very, very successful in every time we put it in place. Marla, and, can I add one thing quickly to your comment? Because I know business owners are wondering, how are we going to fund that incentive yeah. program? <laughs> and, and I'll tell you where, where $77,000 are. Between the 151 X XMOD and the 74 X XMOD is the cash there to fund the safety incentive program. Good yes, point. and it very often doesn't take expensive items. I, mean, I have one employer that does does lunches um, and just adds more lunches, and it's not an expensive item for for them at all. But you're well, right; if the savings should pay for it more than. It, I'm going to interject since we're a little running out of time here. One, it's like you guys read ahead here on the questions, but um, Rhonda asked if safety incentives even work, which I think you're both saying. You know, and, and I know George has talked about this, and Diana, that they do. Um, but isn't there uh, under-reporting that goes along with being incentivized? And also, doesn't Cal OSHA look upon incentive programs disfavorably? Well, I can talk about the under-reporting a little bit. You, you certainly have to educate your employees that this does not mean hide claims. You absolutely have to put that in writing, that it, you're you know, subject to discipline and termination if you don't report claims. That's not what we're encouraging here. We're encouraging everybody to rally around safety. I have not had any issues with OSHA. I'll ask the rest of the panelists, have any of you had any issues with that? Uh, this is Diana, and what I have, what I see from Cal OSHA is they say incentivize safety suggestions, incentivize anything that deals with working safer versus the incentive of lower claims, right? Lower number of claims filed. And then you're in good stead. Good. OK. Yeah, so the example of, of the type of incentivizing that we've done is the number of days without claims um, or without any um, potential claims of potential injuries, keeping track of that. And then when you hit certain days, we haven't had any issues with that. OK, good. George Griff, any, any last comments for th this question? Well, my clients have had tremendous success with the safety incentive programs. Um, they've they've taken experience modification factors well over 200 and driven their uh, X mod down to below below 70. And uh, yes, initially they were they were paying in addition to the high premium, but within a year or two, the savings for workers' compensation more than more than uh, paid for what they were spending on safety incentive. 
okay. boosted morale, uh, and you know, the employees loved it. Good. Okay. Well, unfortunately, and I know we have a lot of questions left here. Um, we have to wrap things up. Um, we did include here email addresses for panelists today, as well as it's on their bios um, in the handouts that we provided with you. So I apologize we didn't get to all the questions today, but certainly follow up with any one of the speakers with your question, and they will be happy to answer that. Um, we're also going to have a privacy in the workplace. Um, the big Sony uh, hack and everything else going on with privacy issues. We have actually a certified privacy expert, Linda Zimmer, going to be talking to us along with Linda and Marla about how to protect data in your workplace and in your business. So there's a link here to register, and you can also register on the handout that we uh, provided with you earlier today. And then, of course, Linda is offering her anti-harassment training for managers in April. This is required for managers and supervisors with over 50 employees for California companies. Um, space is limited, so by all means, use this link to register. Again, good deal, $39 per person. Uh, can't beat that cost. Um, and on behalf of Linda and Marla and the rest of our illustrious panel, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, it really is a heavy topic, and I appreciate all the questions as well as the content that our experts provided. We appreciate your time and look forward to providing you with more useful information in the future. Have a great rest of the day.